guess good afternoon now. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Charles Norton. I'm a visiting assistant professor in French, and it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, artists from the Neolithics All Indigenous Art Collective um, that are visiting with us this week um, as part of our engagement uh, with the Office of International Education at the Andrew Young Center. Um, these are folks from the U.S. states of Arizona and New Mexico, not the country of Mexico. New Mexico is a separate U.S. state, and we've uh, encountered some confusion with that uh, this week. Uh, not for the first time, um, but it's always a good chance to, to interject some geography. Uh, I'm going to let the artists introduce themselves. If y'all have any questions, I work over in Brawley, and if you want to follow up with us, get involved, um, please come by and stop, stop by and see me. Um, but other than that, I'm gonna let y'all take it away and, and give your own introductions if that's cool. Sure. Okay, great. Thank you very much for coming. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Sorry. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, good day uh, to everyone, and thanks for having me. My name is Thomas Reeves Marcus. I go by Reeves. Uh, originally from Phoenix, Arizona, by the way, of uh, the Salt River, Pima Maricopa community, which is a reservation just east of Phoenix, uh, literally like 20 minutes east of downtown. Uh, also an enrolled tribal member of the Thonoff Nation, which is in Southern Arizona. Uh, a couple of us are, are from the same tribe, but we're all kind of uh, fairly mixed as well. Uh, although I'm an enrolled member of the Thonoff Nation, Thonoff translates to the desert people because we're uh, in the desert in Southern Arizona. But I'm also multiple other tribes as well, uh, with, with sprinkles of other uh, uh, bloodlines from overseas. So, but uh, thanks for having me and the uh, artist. It's been, it's been a great uh, trip so far. So, thought it was okay to go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you guys. Good afternoon. My name is Saba, and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. I mean, I am. <laughs> but I have turned my beer can in for a spray can. And um, didn't grow up too traditional in the sense of uh, my indigenous roots because all that you guys probably know was kind of stripped away from us and uh, kind of ran around as a young person not knowing where to go, which direction. Uh, so I found uh, hip hop and graffiti. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, it really uh, helped me get through a lot of that. Those questions, you know, you're not asking questions when you're doing something. So, anyway, I am Navajo and Hamas Pueblo, which translates into Diné or Walatoa. Um, and I've been painting for most of my life at least 15 years on the graffiti side, on the graffiti end. Uh, but the older I get, the less I can do because I have responsibilities and clients and people that need their t-shirts. I just do design, graphics, all kinds of, you know, digital media stuff since it translates right into it, you know, from advertising to marketing and all this cool stuff. Anyway, I'm super stoked to be here. Our relationship as black, or as brown people and black people are kind of blurred in New Mexico and are kind of put against each other in the sense that there is always talk about, we're, you know, we're beefing, you know? And uh, when I got asked to come here, I was excited because there's all but 10% black people in Las Cruces, New Mexico. You know, so just to be thrown in the center of the village is truly amazing. And I cannot express how much uh, love has been shown to us, you know, so. I got more joy in my life because of it. Met some great people, including these guys. And uh, I'm really stoked uh, to be able to travel and to come here and paint for you guys. So I really appreciate you guys letting us come and show off what we can do. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Rezhan. I am originally from uh, South New Mexico. Uh, I live right now in the Salt River and Pima and Maricopa Indian communities where a, a lot of these guys you know, come from. Uh, 
I started uh, painting graffiti about 20 years ago. Um, I actually went to school at the Institute of American Indian Arts, uh, where I was hoping to go into studio art, but I ended up going into graffiti, uh, getting into graffiti instead. Uh, yeah, it's really changed my life, but like for the better. And uh, yeah, thank you guys for having me. Or having us. It's good gosh. Um, my name is Paul Babu, aka Knox. Um, just want to thank you guys, you know, first thing for inviting us and I guess coming to Atlanta. You know, I never, I was telling these guys uh, yesterday, I would have never thought, you know, my art would take us this far, or take me this far, you know, to be here in Atlanta, you know, talking with you guys. And, you know, I like what, what the what the, the vibe is here. The vibe is real strong, you know, between you guys' um, brotherhood. Um, one of, we were talking to another guy, uh, Zion, yesterday. And he, he, he was like, you know, blew my mind just for him talking within that 10 minutes about the school and, you know, giving us a little rundown of the history and, and everything. So I like, I now I take that from here and I'm gonna take that home with me. So that makes me feel good, you know, to teach somebody and to, to uh, more of an uprising, you know what I mean? And, and encouraging people, you know, the same people, you know, my, you know, my people. So, but uh, again, my name is uh, Knox Ones, um, Paul Powell. <clears throat> sounds weird, you know what I mean? Because everybody has their has their aliases, so everybody's like, you know, you got your your real name, but then you have your your your, your alias too. So it kind of, you know, you really don't know who you're really talking to until you meet them face to face. You know what I mean? So, but um, yeah, I'm from the Fountain Mountain Nation. Um, I grew up originally, you know, in Tucson, but I was back and forth between the Tucson and Re and uh, the reservation. And my where the community where I come from is. Uh, um, you go to cells and then you go south and it's maybe five miles from the border so we see a lot of uh, you know border patrol and a lot of stuff that they talk about now you know especially with the, the past past uh, president you know that was his big thing you know what I mean now I mean to me I don't think they really know what's going on because they don't live there they just visual and they get back their feedback from what other people see but to you know from somebody that's been there, and actually lived there, that you, you would know what it is, you know what I mean, you know how it is, I'm right there in, in the front line. So, um, you know, I mean, I, like I said, I'll take, you know, what I've learned from here, you know what I mean, and take them back, take them back home. And, um, but yeah, thank you guys for bringing this out, and um, thanks a lot. <clears throat> Hello, um, dad in and out of prison it was one of those things that I could go always go back to and just kind of immerse myself in it um, and I feel like I've had this journey of just all different types of art and it brought me to to this group um, back in 2015 so uh, I'm really thankful for that and for for these for all of these people here like I've learned so much from all of you and um, it's such an honor to be able to come here and spend this time with you guys. And um, uh, I'm going to school right now too, so I've been in and out of my classes in between this. And uh, one of my professors asked a question, because we were talking about like the difference between living on the reservation and living, or living just in where you grew up, or just you know around people that, you're, that you know, and, and then living where I live now, which is in the city of Tucson. And at first I thought, well, there's not like that much of a difference as far as like feeling safe. Cause I feel like the neighborhoods, there's different things that happen there that when outsiders come, they feel really unsafe, but I don't really feel that way. Uh, cause of who I know and I'm used to those areas, but I definitely feel safer uh, in, in Santa Vere just because you could go you know, to your neighbor, you know them, you go down the street, you know those, you know, like everybody knows each other in that community. And 
And so, so I was thinking about that, and and then we were just talking too uh, the other uh, the other day about how we're so used to being around like our people, and like uh, and so when we go to go out into like in Tucson, it's like the North Side, or uh, when I go to conferences, or yeah, yesterday when we went out to the city, it's uh, it's very different and just being around like a, you know like maybe gun or like white people would probably be a problem and uh, <laughs> um, and so you know we get so used to it and and so like coming here I feel really comfortable like it's just it's such a similar vibe and yeah so I just I really enjoy it I enjoy myself so far and uh, <laughs> a question for you guys. Have, have any of you ever been to Phoenix or Tucson? A couple of you. And, and have you, at the very least, have you at least heard of Tucson, where they're from? Yeah? Uh, maybe you guys want to explain, but you see the hat that Elena's wearing? Maybe uh, my Tucson people can explain where the word Tucson comes from. Okay, yeah. So a lot of a lot of the names, I mean, I mean that's across the country, um, of different cities, streets, and all that, you know, they come from indigenous languages. And so Tucson, uh, we say it Chukchon in, in Auckland. And, uh, and so, yeah, we've been trying to like, um, like in Arizona too, Arizona is, uh, is how you say Arizona. means um, base of mountain. So in Tucson we have, a, it's called Iman uh, University, made that their you know, university mountain or whatever. So that's their, uh, they put a big A on there. <coughs> so they, everybody called it the Iman, but a long time ago before Tucson was around, um, there's Santa Cruz that runs right through Tucson. So that's where our tribal Kumush come live there and you know, Water, you know, there's people that can drink life there, so you know that's where our people were. And then Tucson came and kind of put us, you know, chased us out and put on, put us on the reservation, you know, on the outskirts. But <clears throat> um, so that's where that Chukchong comes from. And when they couldn't say it, they were all just Tucson. So mm -hmm. it, it translated into that. So that's where that comes from. That's where Tucson comes from. And uh, so yeah, I mean. Some of the parks, <clears throat> some of the parks that are, you know, the, the, the streets are, are named, you know, that's a, that's our language that they're using. And they say it different, you know what I mean? Somebody was saying Tohono. Like when you see it, it you know, in, in English language, it's, it's Tohono. I mean, yes, that's how you say it. But in, you know, somebody with a, with a cultural background or that kind of knows about it, it it's um, uh, Tohono. goes down and when colonization happens and all these things, uh, things get twisted around. And, and it was mainly uh, uh, Spanish colonized, colonizers, uh, they called themselves explorers, but you know, we called them uh, invaders basically. They came and set up shop where we're from. Uh, because they couldn't say the words, it, they kind of gave it that sort of like, because they were Spanish speaking from Spain, they gave it that Arizona, like Arizona, Arizona, or, or uh, I kind of hear people uh, with, a, with like a Spanish word, they say, try to say Tucson, like Tucson, but it's really not a, it's not with a T, it's with a, a Tucson. Uh, but I think it's important uh, to point out uh, with the hat.
that that Elena has on, and I think this is maybe true for a lot of us, is that uh, it's it's a big deal for us to be reclaiming our identity and our own uh, homelands and our in our space where we're often left out, marginalized, overlooked, all types of different things get thrown into a melting pot where where our identities try to become erased by just the way things are now. Uh, so doing what we do, uh, being rooted in, 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 in graffiti, all of us, uh, you know, the graffiti itself is rooted in rebellion and going against the grain and coming from a place of making something out of nothing, and especially back uh, uh, if you're not familiar with the origins of the type of graffiti anyway that we're, we're used to and accustomed to with spray paint, uh, 1970s New York, you know, uh, where predominantly it was young black men and, and various other uh, ethnicities as well, Puerto Rican, Irish, Italian, but the origins of like hip hop culture as we know it and how it's evolved today, but the origins of it being like subway painting and how, how it becomes full circle and now you have people in these communities, these native communities in the Southwest and, and beyond, right, worldwide, pick a country and it's there, all comes back and it comes from that, that time period. So we're heavily influenced by that and it's just a, it's a beautiful thing to go full circle and it's, I think it's that reconnecting with uh, that human spirit uh, to be able to understand that we can create because we're always creating no matter uh, when we say indigenous, because well, we're all indigenous people in here somewhere, right? Uh, and we all have that human spirituality, spiritual connection of, of wanting to communicate and create beautiful things. And just, just by our, our so, such complex backgrounds and layered backgrounds. Uh, and, uh, and going back to uh, being where we're at now as native folks, I think we understand that it's, it's provided all these different tools and ideas and how to see the world differently in a different perspective um, and becomes that sort of uh, rebellion in a beautiful way. But we're, we're connected in that way, you know? We're connected to, to, to New York because of that, the origins of hip hop because of that, you know? And, but we're now, like the way things evolve as they grow, uh, we have it with our own flair. Saba has his New Mexico flair, you know? We have our Tucson and Phoenix flair, and then we have other people involved in, in I, I can't even keep track, but we have a lot of people involved in our group that aren't here, and they have their own flares and experiences too, personal experiences, so. Uh, I just think it's super powerful that we're on that tip, and it's great to see Elena rocking that hat the whole time. I'm almost like, that's what's up, you know, because uh, like I was saying, we're on a similar tip, I guess, in that way, of just be sharing that in this kind of space and having this this conversation with you all. And and, and, and at any time, if you, anybody has questions, just please jump in, you know, like, let's make this a conversation. It doesn't have to just be about us, because this is about a dialogue. <laughs> I guess, how was uh, Neolithic founded? Uh, there you go. Right. Who, who got the roof? Uh, oh, got a video. <laughs> yeah, we can play that video. Okay, it, it started from our friend, uh, his name is Dwayne Manuel. He goes by... Dwayne. Various names. Yeah, various <laughs> names. Those last ones. Well, Dwayne or Insano is my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> and we were actually supposed to have uh, one of our other founding members tune in and do an introduction, but I guess she's unavailable, Martina. So, um, but that's a good question. Uh, I guess while he's setting that up, does anybody else want to just brush off a few words about how you with this society? Um, it was basically just an event of Museum. Um, and it just brought so many of us together, uh, so many indigenous writers together from different parts of the country come to this event and um, so they had it the first year and then the second year when they had it again we were just like wow we really like painting together um, you know a lot of us know each other already a lot of us live in the communities that you know that we grew up in or uh, started painting together like a long time ago so it kind of started that way where it was just supposed to be a, a series of exhibitions and shows through the museum but we ended up just you know, slowly turning into a collective because we always like we always wanted to paint together.
And uh, what year was it? I don't even remember now. 2014? 14. 14 or 15. Well, setting that up. But I, I would say primarily we were in the Southwest. But there's a couple sort of on and off members. I think one, I mean, I don't know if we're still counting Attica, but like one in Oklahoma, maybe one further back east, I think. Uh, our friend Bobby Dudes. Uh, Bobby Wilson, who is, uh, I guess you could say, uh, he's, a, he's a writer for a TV show uh, called Reservation Dogs. If, you, if any of you, here's a plug for Bobby since he can't be here, I'm sure he'd love to talk about this. <laughs> but one of our members, Bobby Wilson, uh, is, has been fortunate enough to be a part of a collective of Native American uh, uh, screenwriters to create a show called uh, Reservation Dogs, and it's, it just came out last summer. And um, it's, a, it's about contemporary life in Oklahoma. And even though it's focusing on one community, it's re very relatable for all of us because it's, it's, it's that Native American experience. And again, even though it's very specific, there's a lot of crossover that we can understand and relate to. But it's, it's beautiful because it's really the only contemporary show for Native Americans right now. Uh, and we were having this discussion the other day about how uh, my personal experience, because we can't, I knew I couldn't really see myself in television and entertainment growing up, what did I gravitate to like most people to? It, it, it was the popular black culture, you know, like uh, hip hop, you know, BET, things like that. That's where I could kind of see somebody I could sort of relate to more than, you know, uh, like a John Wayne movie where the natives are actually getting killed in that, you know, like, oh, why would I want to watch that? So of course I'm gonna gravitate towards people of color, but because there's no native representation, uh, it's really hard to find that, and that, that's why it's. I think it's such an important show. Uh, and look it up. It's called Reservation Dogs. Don't not to be confused with Reservoir Dogs, the Tarantino movie, but Reservation Dogs on FX. Uh, it's a great Hulu. show. It kind of shows what's that? It's on Hulu. It's on Hulu. Hulu. But uh, anyways, I just wanted to say that real quick. So, uh, Wait, can, can I, can I, I add to that? Oh, oh. What's that? I caught an episode before. It was really good. Oh, right on. Right on. <laughs> <laughs> young, young kids kind of hustling. Just doing their thing. Yeah. yeah. Just doing their thing. Yeah. Yeah. To, to add to that, um, so representation, right? It's a huge thing. Morehouse College, like just saying that brings like heavy, heavy clout, you know? Um, Indian, you know, see it embedded in your head. Like, um, all these romantic views, right, embedded in our brains from John Wayne, remember this guy, Lone Ranger, and Tonto, everybody knows that. <laughs> that Tonto was our first major representation in uh, mainstream media, right? Because, and Tonto wasn't even Indian. But also, when I, I'm from northern New Mexico, which is, <clears throat> um, you know, northern, and then you got southern, which is closer to the border, which is Spanish, is, is the culture down there, and the language. And somebody says, don't do that, tonto. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what does that mean? I, I mean, are you referring to um, the Indian tonto? <laughs> no, they're like, no, I'm saying, don't do that, stupid. <laughs> and I said, wait, what? Tonto means stupid in Spanish. So our debut was, we got the long ranger and stupid. <laughs> At least that's what my Mexican fans heard, you know. And also, throw this one in. You can't get a Mexican without an Indian. Anyways, this is Dueno Insano, our founding, one of our founding fathers. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> really just uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a
every Native American tribe has an ancient ancestor who, from the beginning of time, drew or painted on a wall, or whether it's on a cave or on the side of a rock. So neoglyphics, neo meaning new, and glyphics meaning the writings on the wall, represents what we do as a Native American graffiti artists. We take this, this medium, this new medium, uh, the spray can, and it's the way that we express ourselves as Indigenous artists. The first neoglyphics I just gathered, people I knew in Arizona, who were all graffiti artists, who I felt who put in the work as far as their graffiti careers go, and we're, we're trying to take it to the next step as far as becoming more established artists. So that's pretty much how it started and it just snowballed from there. We did another event the next year and then from there we just grew naturally into a little collective of graffiti artists. I've been an artist my whole life pretty much as long as I can remember and I was always wandering around my area on the east side of town and I stumbled across a graffiti yard that was pretty close to my home and I fell in love with graffiti then. I walked in and was just in awe of what I saw, all the colors, the letters, the styles, and right then and there I told myself I wanted to do that. For us it was either graffiti or it was either gang banging. And once I saw the way the gangs out in Chicago ran, it wasn't really it was the same as it was in California. Um, and so I automatically just gravitated towards graffiti. Our mission, our goal, is to take graffiti out of a negative light because with everybody here in the group who does it, we all have a graffiti background and we all you know, came up doing the graffiti thing. And, but we grew out of that naturally. We grew out of it as, you know, as we grow, we try new things. We, we have different ideas that come out of it. So just to nurture that creativity, that creative juice that comes with, out of graffiti, I would like people to appreciate it more. It's like, yes, the vandalization comes with it, but you know, uh, instead of just demonizing every person who uses the medium of a spray paint and just disregard it as graffiti, that's something I would like to see change. The thing with us is that when we get together, there's a beautiful harmony going on when we're at a wall. My art's very graphic. I do a lot of characters. One of the characters that I paint a lot is a Thanatham superhero that I created. When I was growing up, there wasn't a lot of literature or even photos or drawings, like imagery that I, that I was really drawn to as far as like Thanatham characters or just native characters in general. Graffiti is a youth, youth-oriented uh, art movement. Youth are drawn to it and they do it, and uh, once they find out that anybody can do it, you know, they run with it. And, and I think a lot of Native American youth gravitate towards it because of that, because they can grasp onto it, something they can call their own, and they can establish themselves as a, as a person, as an artist. And so us being experienced and older, we want to show the youth that they can, they can do it, and it, there could be a lot of positive that comes out, out of it. I was inspired by my niece, and I kind of drew from my other characters, so starting with the, the superhero, um, I kind of morphed her into like a, like a kind of a young girl, maybe teenage character, and then slowly like it morphed into the little girl. Across the border with other youth from other communities, different backgrounds, you give them something different and it's just another tool and resource for them to hopefully apply later some different alternative education, I guess, or just a learning curve, or just, just passing on that knowledge again. It allows people who would never really be around or see graffiti or people practicing with the spray cans, it gives them a little broader view of what people can do with the spray can rather than just like, oh, vandal, you know? It lets people see something they don't normally would see. Graffiti, it's very competitive you know, as to see who's, whose letter style is best or who gets up the most. With us, it's more about collaboration and 
working together and learning from one another and growing with one another. And I think, you know, as indigenous artists, that's just kind of, it comes naturally with us. You know, it's all those teachings, all of the, our indigenous teachings, it, they kind of just come and they just naturally bloom when we're at a wall. Every time I'm painting a wall, it's, it's me representing, of course, who I am and what I've experienced, but also the people that I come from and this, this long history of just making stuff and how it's evolved and how we're still here and being able to survive and, and use our voice to say, hey, you know, don't, don't forget who's, who's still here and who's been here. Basically, to just have those people acknowledge our, our existence still. Yeah, there's tons of more indigenous graffiti artists out there who are doing their thing. We represent what everybody else is doing, and I think what we want to do in the future is expose the world to more indigenous graffiti artists who are doing their thing too. And I think that's because it's bigger than us. designs that we use in like basketry and uh, pottery and different things like that. Um, yeah, that's pretty much what came to me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think what's cool uh, about that is it goes back to what we were just talking about before the video about representation, right? And because we have such a shortage of Especially like on those big platforms, right? The big conglomerates and all that. Uh, as I was saying, we only have that really. We have that one show, and then all those other old shows from decades ago, where it was completely just blatantly racist. But those on the other end, not knowing and having any idea how racist it really was, to them it was very oh, this is romanticized. This the, the idea of the noble savage, that whole thing, and it's still a big thing, and, and that's part of why it's important with the work that we all do and, and Elena's character and finding that empowerment and, 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 and knowing, I'm sure, that there are many young, don't know about them girls and native girls that are seeing that, that are like, I can see myself inside that now. I can see myself represented in that way. So even though maybe we're not visually out there you know, on uh, more than just a handful of shows and, and, and media, uh, it's, it's important for us to connected to our, in, in that grassroots GI do-it-yourself sort of way, um, because who else is gonna do it? So it's important for, I think, each of us as individuals and as a collective and being here to really strive for that. And and we were having another, another conversation the other evening about, uh, as we're all aware of, of, kind of those who are in a bigger position of power who may be What's the word? I don't know, maybe like a gatekeeper of sorts, you know? Uh, well, I think it's, our, from our perspective, uh, how about let's just knock the gate down? How about let's go around the gate? Let's just climb over it. Let's, let's forget that that thing is even there, and we're gonna do it our own way. Even if it doesn't, uh, even if we only get one, even if we only get one show on FX and Hulu, like at least we got one, but we're still gonna keep it on the whole thing. So, but uh, anyways, I, I think that's, so, that was a great question. Yeah. 
still almost like this living artifact behind glass, you know, institutionalized in that way. Uh, and um, romanticized. Romanticized. Um, and with the, even being from the graffiti background um, and painting and transitioning into maybe less or more diverse, a broader spectrum of not just doing lettering too, but incorporating a lot of different elements and therefore becoming more mural painters too, uh, not strictly graffiti lettering, but mural painters that have a narrative and a story and different things happen and incorporating uh, just different symbolism and ideas about contemporary culture, traditional culture, just, just meshing all these worlds together. Um, we see that happen too though with murals. Uh, I forget, we were out at the at the event last night and I, I caught the, I just caught a glimpse of a conversation, I forgot who it was, but there was some some young ladies who were walking by and they brought up a great point about, and I just happened to hear it as I'm walking away about how sometimes now murals, because they become so popular in certain neighborhoods and name a city in the, in the, in the country or around the world, now murals become associated with gentrification, yep. you know? And for us being a part of this for two or three decades, and to see that it's almost like like we don't want that to be on, on us either. We're, we're seeing our the fruits of our labor become now becoming packaged and sold and, and, and made safe for property values to go up, for people to get pushed out and moved out, and, and, and who, who've been there for a very long time. Um, and it's a really hard thing to deal with. It's you know we can all relate to that. We, we see our blood, sweat, and tears. Yeah. We're gonna take a little bit of that and as they're extracting it, it's become something different. It's not what it used to be. And it's frustrating. But if anything, it's motivating to just keep pushing the bar, keep keeping that arrow so like true and, and, and keeping uh just the, the that true that true spirit of where it all really comes from and how we're connected, regardless of where we're from and ancestrally where we're from, where we grew up, what neighborhood, you know. Because that's the one thing, even though they can take all of that and, and try and, and water it down, they can't take the essence away from it, ever. That's always going to be, and that, that's here, right? Don't ever do it. <laughs> uh, I was going to say one more thing about a comparison about on the illegal graffiti tip. So having uh, this background and, and being fortunate that we're connected to these things here uh, as Native people, in this country, we are a tribe, and being fortunate to grow up with that. We also have that, I think we can, it's safe to say, most, we all have that uh, sense of upbringing where we're taught to have a relationship with the land, which we're, we're, we're very fortunate to have that. Obviously, us, you know, we have our, our connection to our homeland, and we're here, we're still, we're, 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 where we're from, we're still here, and we're still having that, that strong connection to, to the earth in that way where our ancestors have walked for thousands of years. Uh, but to tie into the illegal graffiti part, well, you know, when when there, there was a gentleman, uh, there was a man back in the, I forget when that was built, I wanna say the early 1900s, who was a sculptor. And I wanna say his name is, he has a very interesting sounding name. It's like, it's like Gutson Borgelum, I also butcher it. Either way, he was a sculptor, and he had he had pitched an idea about creating these monumental faces in these mountains somewhere in South Dakota called the Black Hills, and the Black Hills are a sacred place. You can look it up. The Black Hills are a sacred place to the to the Lakota, which is the original tribe there, and uh, the way we treat our our connection to the earth is we respect it and we don't deface it and we don't destroy it in that way. So the sculptor had it in his mind, I want to do this monumental sculpture of these faces, of these quote unquote founding fathers. And so he couldn't get funding from a certain group of people, so he asked another group of people that he was a part of, which happened to be the KKK. And you can look that up too. And he got funding from the KKK, and then he was able to create Mount Rushmore. So you think about illegal graffiti, oh, the system doesn't like our graffiti, well, we didn't ask for your graffiti either. So just think of it that way. Yeah, sure. You're sketching mirrors in the bathroom, or scribing them. Not on canvas, not on canvas. Just saying, like, compare.
terrible vandalism, right? But we get locked up, and then we start our pipeline into the prison. I got I got caught at thirteen. I didn't get off probation till I was twenty three, and uh, I stopped doing graffiti in that time, and then I picked up the natural drugs and alcohol. So I introduced myself that way because if I never picked up the can again, I probably wouldn't be here, honestly. You know, so it really works, like my man said right here. You just gotta, you know, keep doing it. And every little tag eventually becomes this mural that we have here on campus. What's up, ladies? No, Resmo. So what? Uh, what it's hard what, to what, get a, what yeah, reasons, with you. I'm tired of hearing myself. <laughs> <laughs> so what? Uh, what reasons are talking about? Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. like um, living off the land, you know. As far as natives, you know, I think you know everybody lived off the land at one time, you know. So, <clears throat> but everything, you know, like the fruits and everything that's going on um, right now back home, um, a lot of uh, it's springtime now for us. But until it starts getting, you know, up into the hundreds up in Arizona, right now it's like a beautiful time because everything's blooming. Everything's blooming right now, and then there's more to come within these couple months. And uh, one of the um, the the fruits that we as 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 all Don Altham, um, uh put on a, a pedestal or like that we use a lot of is the uh, filage. We call it the filage, and that's the saguaro fruit. Um, that's one of the fruits that we use for um, many things. Um, we use it for trade, um, we use it for uh, different things. Um, but uh, yeah, just all the fruits that are coming within the seasons, you know, we had our, um, our winter time. So winter time is kind of our storytelling time. Um, so with Don Haltham in general has um, pretty much like a timeline of what happens throughout the year. Um, in the winter time, it's it's uh, it's harvesting or it's uh, telling stories and harvesting. You know, being close to your family. You know, being close because it's cold outside. In the summertime, is is uh, is more of the crop time. You know, you're you're planting, you're gathering, you're doing all this other stuff. But it's always always something with the families. Families are always together and they're always working together. And so, like New Glyphics, that's pretty much what we're doing. You know, we're we're as a family right now, and we're you know teaching the, everybody else. You know what I mean? But it's it's good that we're going out of our out of our zone to teach other people about what we've learned. So you know what I mean. So I'm, I'm like, it's, it's good to see you know, it's good to be here and to letting you guys know or you know, inform you guys like this is where we're at, this is what we're doing. And, and like I said, in uh, in uh, Arizona and you know, Southern Arizona, right now everything's blooming. Um, so yeah, it's always a good time and everybody's you know. Everybody gets a little bit darker, you know what I mean? You got, you got sun, you got to wear a hat. That's why I wear my hat, and, you know, because that gets gets me, you know, like all, like, burnt and everything, you know what I mean? So, yeah. But, um, yeah, yeah, but another thing is, like, our shells that, that we, that I have right here, this is what we use for trade from, um, what we used to, they call it a salt run. And so when, um, found off them when we had our, uh, well, we would sell our crops, we would sell our pottery, we would sell our, uh, our baskets. Um, but also uh, we had a group of, they called the salt uh, ceremony. And so they had a group of runners. So our, um, our tribe was well known for, uh, for running. So they had a group of runners that were called the salt cer or ceremony. And they would run to the ocean in New Mexico and they would pick salt and also, also the shells. And they would bring it back to uh, Don Altham Wood land, and they would sell it. They would they would sell it with you know with Tucson or the surrounding communities and everything like that, Apaches. And, um, so that's where these shells come from. And we were thinking, oh, why why is he wearing you know shells? You don't live by the, the you know the ocean or anything like that. But that's where these come from. So that's what these represent. And um, and Don Altham. So we run to 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 the ocean to to pick these and you know the salt and for trade. That's what we wear. So when I first started doing graffiti and stuff like that, because I, I I work in youth services right now, so a lot of the kids do ask me time to time like about what I did and isn't graffiti illegal? Like I do hear that a lot. So.
So when I was, you know, first coming up, um, I did get arrested a few times. Um, I was, you know, on the side of the walls, on trains. Um, you know, that's that's my like pathway with doing a lot of illegal stuff first. Um, but now, like as an older person with the last two weeks, I got kids, I got a family. Like it's changed and evolved since then. Because then I knew people that were getting felonies for doing graffiti. You know, and it wasn't even like these big pieces, just like these little things, but you know, because they had so much um, places that they got up and stuff like that, that they could say, oh, that person did it. We got him now, we can get him back for all this stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. So a lot of the people that I knew coming up had big rap sheets, you know? Like if they didn't get you now, they would take pictures of your pieces everywhere, make sure they got that little file on you. So when they do finally hit you up, then it's like, damn, we got you all here, you know? Like back, 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 back. So um, now I'm fortunate enough uh, where I can travel and talk about it with the youth. Uh, a lot of the youth, we've worked with a lot of the youth. I work with it and that's um, a lot of the questions that I do end up getting is like that. And it feels good to teach them in a way where we are still teaching them that, but also um, talking about that past and what we've had to go through to you know, get to this point and stuff like that. But it's really, crazy to see how it went from that to where we're at now where we're here talking about it you know like because you brought us here like it's just so mind-blowing to me and even when I do talk to our youth like in the communities and stuff like that like trying to um, teach them in a way where they're learning it like how we you know like how it uh, goes back to our culture and our roots and the petroglyphs and stuff like that like I think about it as storytelling more as in like defacing things now and stuff I think of my ancestors who did it in ceremony or prayer or to communicate, like, you know, so uh, being here with these guys, I know that they all feel the same way and, you know, we're all doing the same thing together. So it feels really good because it feels really spiritual. It feels very honest. It feels like we're doing what that, that whole uh, time of illegally doing all this stuff brought us here today. Um, I just wanted to follow up on that because you said a lot of you said like as you're getting older um, a lot of things have changed so um, like how do you how do you guys like nowadays plan to like pass down how you guys been brought up without because like obviously you don't want your kids getting arrested for the same things you were doing mm -hmm. so like how do you like pass down that same type of, of culture I know there's other, like uh, different things in your culture that you can pass down but how do you like add that type of art aspect to teaching the newer generation? Uh, well, right now, right now, actually, um, I know a parent that's kind of going through that because her kid's starting to write on stuff, tagging things in school, getting, you know, in trouble with like, the authorities. And she basically just wants, uh, you know, people that she knows to mentor him, like, you know, just talk about it and also be very real about, you know, the consequences because, you know, there was a guy that I just, a friend of mine had sent me his picture. He got um, arrested last week for graffiti. This guy was everywhere, like no respect for murals. You know, he was bombing through everything. I mean, I went downtown and I was working on a mural and his tags were everywhere. But like in the end, they, they caught him last week and he's looking at a lot of, you know, damage just because, you know, he went through murals, he went through everything. So I guess, when you're passing that kind of stuff, it, it is real to say, like, you have to be real, like, if you're gonna do that and go that path, like, it, it's still very real that, you know, people still do get arrested for graffiti. Yeah. 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 I think one of the things about the, the graffiti culture, the subculture, uh, although it's, it's evolved and boomed from, clearly from the origins of, of the 70s and 80s in New York on the trains, uh, I, I think a lot of the protocol and how you carry yourself is still the same as long as you are have the the right mentors around you um, and, and I think this is, and I think I'm talking more specifically about those who are still active even at an older age maybe still doing graffiti in some way uh, it, it's always been good to have those types of people around where they can show you the ropes uh, let you understand that hey you know certain things at least in our generation, and, and, and the person she's talking about that caught, got caught last week in Phoenix uh, was really young.
on, I think he's only 20. And I don't think he had any kind of uh, mentorship or any kind of pull. He, he, he didn't have like an OG to look up to, you know, to, to like kind of guide him through. Even if it were still on the illegal tip, he didn't have that, that he was just, just, just going as well on the city. And that's part of it. I mean, that's unfortunate, that, that's just what it is. But I'm just coming from, I think our, our generations, we always had people involved that were older, that were like, hey, here's sort of like, and you would, it's kind of sounds weird, right? Like you would think graffiti doesn't have rules and then sometimes it really doesn't. But really there, it does have a set way of protocol, how you act, how you carry yourself, how you interact with other people. It's it's another form of tribalism in, 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 in with tribalism in, in community, in subculture and culture in general. It, it's, it's important to have that knowledge um, that you pass down. And, and so it's a good question that you brought up and she's bringing on to that great point about that. Um, and, and even though he's not here, uh, Dwayne in the video, uh, he himself is an art teacher. And, and doesn't teach necessarily graffiti, but it's, it's been, a, it went to school, got his bachelor's uh, degree, he's been a teacher for a very long time. Uh, even him and I did a project for a short period of time on the, on the reservation where we were teaching, not graffiti, but we were using aerosol, we were using that as a way to, to entice and engage with the youth so they could relate to it, because a lot of that is popular culture right now, and then a lot of youth are interested in, in however they take it, they get interested in painting and writing, graffiti, just the, the colors and, and the use of the tool. So uh, it, it, I think it was a different approach for us, not from a graffiti perspective, but how do we how do we bring them in and say, yeah, okay, we're gonna show you how to use the spray can, but first we're gonna reintroduce you to your culture and your background to make you understand the parallels of like what she was saying about Petroglyphs and just making basketry and these things, and why we paint walls now, and why we paint murals, cultural, culturally relevant murals that can reflect where we came from, where we are, and what we're going into the future. And all that is, is, is extremely important, right? And it's, it, it's like that old saying it takes, it takes a village, you know? Um, I, I feel maybe most of us are thinking and beyond uh, our group uh, feel that. It's a great question. Thank you for asking that. That's how it was when we started doing the feed, you know, we started throwing ideas on, you know, on the surface. We started blurring everything up that's around you. And so sometimes it's more of a focus. So with me, that's what I did when I was, you know, when I was younger. It was more of like, you know, things are going around you, you know, the negative stuff, but then you're focused on one thing and it kind of keeps you out of that negative spot. So you're more of, you know, you're focused in and once you, once you bring it out, you know, show somebody, you know, it's not a lot of not a lot of people that are like it, but you know, people that do like it that are that have that, you know, that same kind of vibe, they're gonna, you know, appreciate it and it makes you feel good, you know, that you're doing it. And I have daughters too that, you know, I'm not trying to show them, you know, their graffiti world, but you know, they know how to spray paint, they know how to do all this other stuff, but you know, I would want them to do more something more with that, you know what I mean? At least they know they can maybe like a big mural or something. Let them put themselves, you know, being young, they see it now. So when they when they get older, oh yeah, I can do that. You know, that's just you know, they know how to go about that. But you know, like from somebody that doesn't know that background, that that's something you know they have to work on. You know, as they get older. But you know, my daughters, you know, now that when they see that, and they're like, oh okay, yeah. I mean, the same thing with the red one, and, and so what that happened yesterday. They they they're seeing those visuals and they're they're learning from us. And, but it's more like a positive. You know, I mean, some of the, you know it has a negative that they see, but that's something that we're there for, you know, that they know, hey, you can do this, you can do that, and it can go a lot further than where I'm at right now. So that's, you know, mentoring and visually and, you know, doing all that. Yes, sir, you had a question for you. Um, what, what are some life lessons that you all learned through graffiti? Through graffiti? Lessons through graffiti? Life lessons. Oh, life lessons. <laughs> Asking for permission. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> because my well, because my tag is run, but I asked for permission. Because the the building owner or whoever owns the property was just so blown away that I asked. Learn from.
from your mistakes too, because I have I've had uh, friends who uh, bomb churches, and uh, yeah, and uh, they get a lot of bad negative from that. So like me, I learned like I stay away from places of worship where that people hold in high regard, simply because you become a big target too. So it's also like either your mistake or other people's mistake too that you can see and not do that. Like okay, I'm not going to do what that guy did. And just for reference, the, the term bomb is actually not Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Sorry, I should have. <laughs> All our phones are red flag. Should have my phone in the hall. <laughs> Don't bomb churches, guys. <laughs> <laughs> definitely find out who's a solid person and who is gonna snitch on you. But you sometimes learn it's better to go by myself or you know, or some people who, who have your back and be like, yeah, I know that I, I can trust them because he stayed with me through the bad, a bad situation, like another crew will roll up on you. And your homie will probably sit and get his ass beat with you or he's gonna run and leave you. So you learn solid people through graffiti as well. I don't remember who said it yesterday, but um, somebody was talking about um, just kind of like the temporary nature of, of, of art. Um, and, and I thought that was like a really dope lesson. Yeah, um, that, yeah, I guess so. I mean, uh, well, back to permission, asking permission is just really respect, right? Which I think is what our religion is, is respect. Um, but what, what I, yeah, I did definitely, uh, I, I stated that because uh, Notice the kids, right, or the students were, by the way, they just did, it just consumed them. It was awesome, right? And at one point, I felt responsible because I removed the the uh, the barriers that were supposed to keep them out. 